Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Hortensia Calvo. I'm the director of the Latin American Library. And I am beyond happy to welcome all of you to the library this evening. Um, I would like to thank especially uh, Thomas Reese, who is the executive director of the Stone Center for Latin American Studies, um, and who has partially supported this event. Um, and also um, David Banish, the Dean of Libraries at Tulane, who always supports the Latin American Library. Um, I also want to say a special hello to friends from the um, New Orleans community who have come and braved the parking situation at Tulane. So, so hopefully we'll make your time worthwhile. It's very hard to park on campus. So, of course, our guests of honor, uh, Joao and Fatima Farkas, Bendindus, a very warm welcome to you, um, once again to New Orleans and to the Latin American Library. And just, I just have to say that I think with Joao and Fatima, something, they, they, they got the thing for New Orleans. It's something that happens to you and it happens to a lot of us who are from the, the parts of Latin America that are part of the African diaspora. I know because I'm from Cartagena in Colombia and it happened to me. Um, you come here and you just walk around and within minutes you feel an attraction, you feel an affinity to New Orleans. Um, you feel the poetry of New Orleans. Not every place, believe me, has it. Um, and I think it happened to the two of you. So I, I know it happened to the two of you. So I hope what this means is that we will collaborate in many projects in the future and that you will come many, many times to New Orleans and to Tulane. Um, it's such an honor to present the work of Joao Farcas, one of Brazil's most renowned documentary photographers. Joao was born, alas, in Sao Paulo. <laughs> um, I'm kidding. Um, they were, he was born in Sao Paulo, but he's an adopted son of Bahia, um, a place with a lot of poetry, uh, much like New Orleans. He graduated with a licenciatura in philosophy from the USP, the Uni University of Sao Paulo and also studied at the School of Visual Arts and the International Center of Photography in New York. And over the years, he has worked for the principal magazines of Brazil, such as Veja and Istoia, um, serving as photographic editor of Istoia. Um, in 1986, Joao won the Aberge Award as well as a grant from the Vita Foundation for the Amazonia Project, of which this exhibit um, is a, a projection, a development of. And since then, Joao has produced several major photographic series, including projects that document life in the coastal city of Trancoso in, Brazil, in Bahia, the carnival masks of Maragogipi, also in Bahia, and the large tropical wetland of Pantanal, which are ongoing projects. Um, you can see photographs from some of these series in the looping images shown on the large screen in the lobby, and as well as uh, a documentary um, featuring Joao and other photographers that was being shown here, but is now in the back on the other screen in the seminar room. In 2015, Joao launched the exhibition and book Amazonia Ocupada, which was exhibited first by the Sesqui in Sao Paulo and curated by Paulo Herkenhoff, one of Brazil's most renowned curators. 41 selections from this exhibit form the basis of our exhibit here of Amazonia Ocupada. The project documents Brazil's gold rush 
from the 1980s and 1990s that brought so many prospectors to um, the Amazon River Basin, a huge area which is about the size of the continental United States. Uh, not all of it in Brazil, but, but it is huge. Um, and they, they went there to search for gold and to find their fortunes, but unfortunately wreaking havoc with local populations, local indigenous populations, and with the natural environment. And I am just thrilled that we have recently acquired a total of 22 limited edition and signed photographs from the Amazonia Ocupada series by Joao Farcas to form a permanent part of our uh, image archive at the Latin American Library, which will be made available to researchers, to students, and for the classroom. We have a very special program tonight. We begin with a conversation with Joao, led by Christopher Dunn, a uh, professor of Spanish and Portuguese and Africana studies uh, here at Tulane. Chris's research focuses on cultural politics during the period of the Brazilian dictatorship in the mid 20th century. He also works on popular music, race relations, and black culture in Brazil. He is the author of Brutality Garden, Tropicalia, and the Emergence of a Brazilian Counterculture from 2001. In 2016, he published Contra Cultura, an alternative arts and social transformation in authoritarian Brazil. Both books published by the University of North Carolina Press. And with Charles Perrone, he is co-editor of Brazilian Popular Music and Globalization from 2001. And with Idelbert Avelar, of, uh, he's the co-editor of Brazilian Popular Music and Citizenship from Duke University Press. Chris and Joao will discuss the making of the photographic series Amazonia Ocupada, the exhibition, its historical context, and its relevance today, and many, many, many other things. But what we hope is that the conversation sparks uh, questions from the audience about Brazil, and so we can open the dialogue to everyone. They will be speaking for about half an hour, 20 minutes, yeah, maybe, half an hour. maybe even less. I want to make okay. sure that we have time. That so. everyone is, um, is in included. Um, in addition, then, to viewing Joao's extraordinary photographs displayed on our walls all over the exhibit, I hope you've had time to, to see some of it. I also hope you have time to um, look at our exhibit cases. There's one back there, and there are two in the lobby and the four in here, um, where we try to weave a complementary story um, to interact with the photographs that traces some of the most notable Western conceptions of the Amazon uh, over the last 500 years through the rare books and uh, maps from the Latin American Library Special Collections. And in this way, we suggest a dialogue between Joao's complex vision of the 80s and 90s gold rush and a broader historical context of varying and often destructive efforts um, to appropriate and master the abundant wealth of the Amazon, which is often called the lungs of the world. And it is particularly important now um, that we look at this age old story and that we are reminded of these incursions and their destructiveness, um, especially now when political events in Brazil are conspiring to um, erode these long fought protections of the region. So to conclude, I have to say that this exhibition, exhibition and this event have been the product of truly joyful and sustained collaborations. Over a year ago, Chris Dunn first came to me to propose this project, and his boundless enthusiasm, his passion for everything, including Caipirinhas. Oh. Uh, we have him to thank for that. And his knowledge has been the driving force from the beginning. He and João Farcas curated the photographic portion of the exhibit, 
with probably a little meddling from Chris Hernandez and, and from me, uh, the selection and description of materials and the narrative that we wove in the exhibit cases uh, were the result of a, of, uh, a really dynamic conversion of, of contributions by Chris Dunn, by Christine Hernandez, the curator for special collections at the Latin American Library, Rachel Stein, who is our uh, research and instruction librarian at the Latin American Library, and for me. As we brainstormed and then we explored and unearthed some of the treasures of the Latin American Library to try to weave this story, I was, I have to say, I was surprised at some of the things we found. It, it was amazing. And then, of course, Felipe Cruz. I don't know where Felipe is. Uh, there he is. He's hiding. <laughs> you have to come. Grand appearance. Felipe Cruz. <laughs> yeah, you were hiding. You can't hide from him. He's an assistant professor of history uh, here at Tulane. And he brought his, his he's another passionate Brazilian, or Brazilian is. Um, you're a Brazilian. Um, he brought his passion for technology to the mix in ways that will enhance our experience. And given that we don't, can you just say briefly what they can do to do this? He developed an app for this exhibit that we're, we're trying out today. So, so it's, uh, <laughs> so it's just a little companion. Uh, Oh, sorry. So it's an app that's a companion to the content of the exhibit and allows you to kind of delve deeper into the, the, the work of Jean Farkas. And if you, um, it's an augmented reality app. And if you don't know the term, if, if compared to virtual reality, just something that you look at the actual reality around you and adds virtual elements. So if you download it, you can look at the photos and the map around the exhibit with your cell phone, and you get some extra buttons and virtual buttons. And you click on, you can see videos of uh, of João speaking about the fo the photos. You can see some satellite imagery of the locations where the photos are taken, as well as the curatorial information about them. So, um, so what's the app? So it's uh, curator, as in a augmented reality AR. So curate AR, curator, uh, uh, curator <laughs> Farkas. If you look, uh, and unfortunately, it's not available for iPhones today. Uh, yes. Yet. Uh, yet, yet, yet. Uh, they're a little more picky about their. When is uh, the virtual <laughs> reality version going to be? <laughs> Goggles. The, 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 the virtual, the virtual reality yeah. version released yeah. next year will allow you to walk through the Amazon and uh, experience that yourself. But uh, <laughs> so, uh, if you have an Android phone, uh, you can download it. If not, reach your friend. We have a tablet running around. You can borrow my phone for a little bit if you want. Uh, but um, but yeah, just look around and you see little icons floating under the photos and you can click on them and, and learn more about the work and see um, kind of a deeper dive by by Juan explaining the photos and the context and the characters in that. So that's it. Thank you Thank so you. much for all that work. And the exhibit will be up until August. Yes. will be up until August, so by that time maybe Apple has responded and, and people with iPhones can, can use it and we may have, who knows, Felipe might invent something else by then. Um, so I also have to say that hands down I work with the best group of people on the planet. I work with the people at the Latin American Library. And I also, besides Chris Hernandez and Rachel Stein, um, Veronica Sanchez, Madeline White, Carola Vila, and um, Sarah Kittleson were instrumental. <laughs> Without them, this doesn't happen, trust me. Um, and most especially, too, I'm grateful to Joao for allowing us to serve as a repository of his work, for that honor. And also for his generosity and laid backness in allowing us to experiment, to understand, and to kind of improvise also as we created the exhibit cases to improvise on his vision of Amazonia. So thank you so much for that. So please join me in welcoming Joao Farkas and to the opening of the exhibit Amazonia Acupada.
Thank you, Hortensia. I wanted to add my own uh, words of um, gratitude and um, of, of welcome um, here. And I, I want to start by thanking um, Hortensia, uh, the, the director of the Latin American Library, who has really um, just done amazing things with this space. Uh, I arrived uh, here in 1996, so I've been here for a long time. Um, and we, we had a wonderful director before, Guillermo uh, Nanez. Um, but I have to say that Hortensia has just uh, created this space into something that is so welcoming and interactive and intellectually engaged. Uh, those of you who know me here on campus know that I spend a lot of time here at the Latin American Library. Uh, I have a carol here. Um, I love my department, my home department in Spanish and Portuguese, but I actually prefer to work here in my carol and be here. Um, and so I spend a lot of time here, and it's a very special place for me personally and intellectually. And so it's a great pleasure uh, to uh, be able to participate uh, in this program here at the LAL. Um, a word about, uh, about Hortensia. Um, we've been working very intensely on this project uh, for the last year, and she is, I can tell you, a very energetic, intellectually brilliant, and also very detailed-oriented. We have a whole category that we uh, used as a shorthand, and it's called raffia questions, and that comes from this little ribbon, this black ribbon of raffia. And this, was, this came out of a discussion that we had one day where she was just trying to decide what color of ribbon, what color of raffia we should use. And, and it was very important. She said, these are the little details that are very important. And then it became the raffia and the cachaca question <laughs> and what to do about that. So these are all things that uh, are very important to, to Hortensia and I think that uh, has contributed to making this a very, very uh, special event. I also want to thank uh, all of the staff of, of LAL that worked um, so passionately um, with us to put this um, event together. Before um, going on, there's a couple of other, a few other um, shout outs, I guess you could say, or welcome, special welcome, because uh, we have some visiting scholars uh, from other universities, uh, two of whom will be participating in an event tomorrow, Amazonia Ocupada Symposium, and if, for those of you who have a program, please look at the back of the program um, and you'll see the schedule of events. It's, we start at 10 a.m. over in Jones Hall 10, uh, at the uh, Center for Latin, Stone Center for Latin American Studies. Um, and joining us tomorrow, in, a, in addition to four faculty members here at Tulane, um, Chris Lane, Felipe Cruz, um, and, uh, William Ballet and, and Sarah Mel Melman, who's a, uh, a PhD student. Um, we have two visitors, um, Seth Garfield, from professor of history from the University of Texas, who I believe is there in the, in the back, uh, and Beth Conklin of uh, Vanderbilt University, an anthropologist from Vanderbilt University. And, I, and I, I hasten to add that we have a selection of books related to Amazonia here and their books are there. So if you want to consult them, they're very important scholars of Amazonia coming from two different uh, but related disciplinary perspectives and we're so delighted to uh, have them here. As an additional lineup, uh, Broadwin Fisher is here from the University of Chicago. She's actually, unfortunately, not gonna be able to participate in the symposium but gave a wonderful lecture last night on her work um, on race and, um, and, and urbanity and, and, and spatiality, if you will, in the city of Recife. Um, and so welcome, and I'm so glad you're able to join us tonight. Um, this is a very special night for me personally. Um, I have known João and, and Fatima for over 30 years. In fact, I was first friends with Fatima going way back. Um, and I have to say before I talk a little bit about João, that Fatima, I, I, sometimes I look at Joan and I think, 
that's the world's most interesting man. You know the, the Dos Equis commercial uh, with all of the travel? And I said, but Fatima is actually more interesting. Um, <laughs> and and uh, she has had quite a career herself. When I met her, she was working uh, in uh, furniture design. Uh, and then she got into music production and concert promotion and then moved back to Sao Paulo and created all kinds of amazing uh, things for the house, lamps and everything back into design, then became a yoga master and opened a yoga studi studio, then aromatherapy, and now, and I can't even keep up, I'm only giving you half of it, um, and now she is uh, creating her own line of jewelry um, based on uh, the cultural religious symbols of Bahia in Salvador, and she's wearing some right now. It's not meant as a commercial, but um, I did want to um, also draw attention to this amazing person right here, Fatima Farkas, um, which is how I got to know Joao. And um, over the years, we've had tremendous conversations. Um, and a, a couple of years ago, he showed me this catalog. And I'm wondering, in fact, if we can pass it around and you can see a more um, of the photos because we weren't able to use all of them. And I said, well, we should do something at Tulane. And, and that's how this all started. But to start the conversation finally, I know that's a lot of prologue. Um, I did um, want to ask you, Joao, about the origin, how this all came to be. Um, remember that this is these photos are from now almost 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago, right? Um, and uh, yet in, in an in a, in a interesting kind of way, so timely. And I was wondering if you could talk about the origin, how it came about this project. Okay, I will avoid, uh, number one, excuse my English, I'm not a native speaker, but I think it's better than speaking Portuguese. <laughs> uh, so, I I was uh, I was working I, I I after school I I went working in photography, and uh, I ended up being a photographer and an editor at a weekly magazine like Time or Newsweek, and uh, so I worked there for four or five years. Very good school, very good projects. I I, I came once to the Amazon for them, and uh, of course. All Brazilian photographers working in photojournalism were very attracted by the Amazon. I'm sorry people can't see us yeah, in you the can back, stand up. but yeah, sure. I think it's more friendly if we stand up. And uh, <laughs> I'm not the title, so excuse me. So, uh, so the Amazon was very was always an attraction for Brazilian photographers because uh, the Amazon is like more than half the country. And in the 80s, until the 80s, it was very difficult to get to the Amazon, unless you lived in Manaus or in Belém or some other cities around. The, it's very scarce populated and no roads and no airplanes to go and so. Uh, so it was like living a uh, neighbor to a very interesting subject and not being able to to reach. So uh, it, I think that feeling is, was in almost all my colleagues. And uh, so one day I got a call from, from Ricardo Lessa, which is, was a reporter from uh, Square Magazine, and very fond of the Amazon subjects. And he tells me, look, uh, there is all this gold rush in the Amazon as we knew. Uh, and uh, I was called by a, a prospector. The actual was the president of a union of prospectors, gold prospectors, and and he invited me to go to the Amazon with a photographer. I said, "Are you kidding?" Because this these guys were having the the worst media possible. They were having like a hundred percent negative media because they were destroying the Amazon. They were killing the Indians. They were uh, destroying the rivers and so on. And how come they are inviting us? And because actually you could not reach the, the garimpos. 
because mainly they were very far away in the in the middle of the jungle, and you could only reach them through an, a small airplane that would land on that area. And the owner of the airstrip was the owner of the the region, so you would only get in if you were allowed it, and they wouldn't allow anybody. So you could go to Serra Pelada, which was a very huge mine, open mine, with 60, 70,000 people there, because there were roads going there, because it was a region explored by Vali near Carajás. Uh, but other than that, you couldn't go, you couldn't reach this place. So they wanted nobody to see. But this very smart man, I'll see, uh, uh, I will remember his complete name, he, he thought, he was very smart, he said, we have a 100% negative media, so if we bring someone here, maybe they have like 5% uh, in favor of us, maybe they understand why we are here and who is here and exactly what we are doing. He thought that maybe showing uh, what they were doing could get some more of a uh, real vision and not a preconceived. So uh, we, we made an agreement with him. Uh, the fir first agreement was, of course, they would not kill us, which was <laughs> uh, uh, even afterwards. And we didn't, we didn't make any compromise. We didn't say that we would publish anything. We, 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 we're just going there. So uh, they took us to maybe four or five different locations around. Without their support, it was impossible to get there. And uh, with their support, it was very, very good, very good. So we were amazed. We spent, I think, 10 days uh, going forth and back in the Amazon, different places. And I was absolutely amazed by, by what was going on there. Uh, we met all these people from all over the country and uh, from different regions, from different backgrounds, um, this craziness going after gold and uh, roads and, and uh, lumbers and commercial and commercial merchant people and missionaries and every in Indians. And so I, I talked to Ricardo, we are not stopping here. We, let's do the story. And we, we didn't know that it would take us 10 years and a lot of effort to, to come back because the Amazon is very, very, very spread out. The subjects are like sometimes from Rio Branco to Belém, it's, it's, it's easier to come back to Sao Paulo and then fly again to Belém because there is no connect flight and so on. So we never knew beforehand what we were trying to do and what we would achieve. And I want to stop talking because I'm <laughs> talking too much. But no, this is wonderful, and, <laughs> yeah. I, and 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 I wanted to follow up because um, it, first of all, it reminds me that this documentary in Portuguese is called Olhar Amazonia, or Seeing the Amazon, that features interviews with some of the major photographers of the Amazon region, including Joao, but also includes an interview with Ricardo Lessa, who's a very prominent journalist in in Brazil uh, still to this day, in which he mentions that that you know they were invited up there. But he told them, he said, look, we're not, we're not going up there to do propaganda for you. We're, we're going to just go without any, you know, and we're going to report on what we see. Um, and sort of what Juan well, was, was explaining. But I, then the follow-up question, this is something that I actually never really understood. Because um, Ricardo later on actually published a book, a small little book, that's in one of our um, cases out there, vitrines out there. And actually comes with a little photo of shows Juan and, and Ricardo circa 1990 on the Trans-Amazonia Highway. Um, and it's called Amazonia as raízes da destruição, the roots of destruction. Um, but I'm curious about the journalistic reporting that Ricardo did in any publications in popular magazines that would have had an influence on how the Brazilian public regarded the Garimpo. I mean, was, did, did in, I guess I, it, you know, what I, what I, did the, did your work there have an impact at that time, or is it only later in that you've been published, you know, as on, in Amazonia Ocupada? Was there, was there journalistic publications that intervened in the discussion around that at that time? Yes, there were, there were several publications, uh, different aspects. Uh, also because the way we got there 
uh, was selling stories, uh, partial stories to different magazines. So Folha de São Paulo, Jornal do Brasil, even Goodyear, the, the rubber and tire company, they, they had a beautiful magazine in Brazil and they hired us to go to, to Acre mm -hmm. to, to photograph the, the rubber tappers. Mm -hmm. There are some of the pictures of them okay, here. So we did some specific stuff. That's how we could uh, reach these places. Even General Motors lent us a car, a uh, truck, so that we could do the Cuiabá Santarém Road, which is very funny because it's a, it's a road that was open in the 70s. Uh, and uh, so we, we got this car in Cuiabá, in Mato Grosso, and the plan was to go to, to Santarém. So we got to, to Cuiabá, we got this car from, from General Motors, and uh, we stopped in a, in, a, in a gas station, and the guy asked, where are you going? We said, oh, we are going to Santarém. The guy looked at us, how are you going to Santarém? We said, oh, we are going to take the road. He said, there is no road. And we said, how come? He, it's in the map. He said, no, yes, it's in the map, but it's gone. <laughs> they built a road, they, they gave the land to, to settlers, to people from the south. You can even see somewhere pictures out, from out there. people from the south of Brazil that came not to, to, to in search of gold, but to, to farm. The settlers were there and they never maintained the, the road. So like six years in a month, in a year, it was raining too much so they could not get out or get in. So it was, it was unbelievable. And we took this road, we learned it a lot. Like uh, uh, for instance, you, you're never the last in a group of trucks because if you are in the middle, they cannot let you there because they cannot pass. So you should be out and not, never be the last. And uh, some other tricks that we learned, we, we always gave high rights to people because if something happened, they could help and so on. But, uh, but coming to your, your question. Uh, so we, we sold a lot of stories. One, of, one or two of them were very strong and they came out as a, a positive influence like talking about the gold mining and uh, some uh, ecological problems and uh, questions with the engines and so on. But uh, we cannot say that we changed the, the, the whole story because uh, already the country had a very strong impression that something very bad was going on. The only thing people didn't realize exactly and how and uh, especially for us, what was very interesting, that's the main point of my work, as you can see, it's the story of these people. Uh, I, I, I even say that, I was telling to your students yesterday, uh, these people were in the middle of nowhere with no cell phones, with uh, no signal for TV, with no newspaper, no nothing. Uh, they had no news from their families, their families had no news from them. So every place we came, as you can see, people were very open to have their pictures taken and to tell their stories. They wanted to convey their stories, they wanted to, 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 to share the, the situation they were living, and uh, which was very interesting. Uh, I also said that yesterday, uh, in the 80s, there was not such a uh, ecological uh, ideology. It was not very widespread. And the question of conquering the Amazon was always a problem, our uh, main problem in Brazil. We always felt that the Amazon wasn't really ours, that it could be taken by somewhere else, by another country, and so on, if we didn't occupy the Amazon. Uh, that was a feeling that comes from the 16th century. It's a, it's a new urge for Brazil to occupy the Amazon in a way that the country doesn't lose it. And we never knew, and it was never very easy because there wasn't much money to be done there. So that's why the country never re uh, really took 
possession of the Amazon. But this feeling was there, and people were very, very proud of being there, being a pioneer. Being, uh, this pioneer spirit was there. So these people were very proud of what they were doing, even if they were cutting the trees. Uh, of course, nobody was proud of killing the Indians, uh, but uh, what, uh, even the gold miners, they were saying, we are, we are pioneers, we are, we are conquering the Amazon. So, uh, and we, we were very careful not to judge these people. In general, we met very poor people coming from very poor situation in their background, uh, especially from the Northeast. And they were looking for a better life. They were looking for making fortune to give a house to their family or to, to feed themselves. So in general, the situation of these people are so, they are so in a suffering situation, at the same time with a very high spirit of uh, conquer, of taking their destiny on their hands. So you can see most of the pictures, they're very proud. They display a very strong feeling of uh, we are doing something. We are conquering, we are taking our destiny on our hands. So this is something that is very present in the pictures. I wanted to, you're talking about, it looks like my microphone isn't working, so let me just borrow yours. Um, some of the, the some of the distances in the map that I just wanted to draw everybody's attention. We actually have a map out here that shows um, all of the places where Zhuang uh, did work, and it's really impressive, the, the geographical, gra ge geographical distribution. There's also another map that I wanted to point out um, in one of the cases in the back, I think it's case number five, dedicated to a, a magazine called Heali Daji, which, um, seven. Seven. number seven, thank you, oh, case number seven, it's in the back there, which is a kind of, it was kind of like time life. Um, it was um, noted for sort of new journalism, new investigative journalism. It was, it was active between 1966 and 1976. And in 1971, Heali Daji did a big um, spread a big feature on the Amazon, Amazonia, featuring a lot of photographers, including some of the photographers that we have in, in our other cases. Uh, but it also includes a map there. And what's very interesting is that you can see that they've already sort of determined the routes before they were actually built, um, and actually um, uh, determines the areas where they're going to do specific types of mining or specific types of agricultural activities. And a lot of this, I think it should be noted, is coming very uh, specifically or very explicitly from a discourse created by the military regime at that time that saw the Amazon. They had this phrase that Amazon is a place without people for people without, no, a land without people for people without land, which of course is totally a lie, which is totally false. But it was this idea that Amazon was there for uh, development, for en enrichment. Um, one of the other things that we did with that case was went through and looked at all of the advertisements um, that were played into this narrative, and, and we kind of explained that there. But I wanted to just ask you very briefly to talk about something, and I want to I want to open it up to, to other questions, because um, I want everybody to, to have a chance to participate. But those of you who have the program, I'd like for you to open it up, and I think it's on page three. Um, I'm not going to be able to read it because I don't have my glasses, but let me find those. Can you just hold that for a sec? Um, did I put them down? Yeah, here we are. Okay. So if you can or if you don't have a program, look on with someone. And so I'm going to actually read the whole quote. This is something that João wrote in the Amazonia Ocupada uh, book. Um, and it was a quote that Hortensia and I would go back and forth saying, what does this really mean? And she would say, go call Drone and ask him what he means. And I never got around to asking you. So, this, so I figured I'd ask you right now. And so here is what he said. Someone once told me, following Sartre, beauty won't save what it shows. But my instincts told me the whole time that it was urgent and necessary to go out and photograph. To photograph all that I could, to return and return as often as possible. Show others what my eyes had seen to somehow create a warning, even if for history, 
to fight the terrifying sensation of irreversibility of silent and unpunished crimes, and at the same time be capable of understanding motivations and giving voice to the anonymous characters of that saga. I think that really encapsulates really very well the whole project. But I wanted to go back to that phrase, beauty won't save what it shows. And this is the, we were saying, what does this mean? What does this mean? So I'm wondering if you could tell us about it. Well, I finally got around to it. <laughs> Uh, well, first I want to make a parenthesis. There is a lady here that said that she came and her mother is very fond of uh, Sebastian Salgado's work. And, uh, and I mentioned that because it's a good start to answer this question. Uh, Sebastian Salgado is a very important photographer and happens to be from Brazil happened to have uh, photographed the, the Serra Pelada uh, uh, mine and beautiful pictures. And he's being accused as uh, every su successful person in general has many people talking against him, so especially in Brazil. Uh, he's been accused of uh, making beautiful pictures out of suffering out of uh, poor people, out of uh, migrants, or so on. And, uh, and that's a very important question for photographers. And uh, because we are dealing, uh, uh, photography is, uh, even today I was, I was a little bit of an emotion here when I was signing the pictures that will remain here. I was putting the, the data, the day where the pictures were taken, they were taken like 32 years ago. And I was uh, getting emotional because uh, it's a profession. It's what I do. I do it every day and I did it as a living uh, to sustain my family and so on. It's also a passion. It's also maybe a form of art. But uh, what impresses me in photography, it's uh, I am an old timer. I do I do appreciate much the fact that photography is is a document. It's uh, it's been told very much against photography today. People say photography photograph photographs lie. Photographs are fake. Photographs can be manipulated and so on, so it's not a document, it's fake. And of course, you can say this about the language, the written language, you can say that about anything. But for me, photography have both sides. At the same time, it could be a form of expression and uh, to, to reach people from the sense, from the sense side. But Inevitably, for me, it's a document. So, how do you come and photograph uh, the, the forest being burned without uh, appropriating it from a statical point of view? It's always there. It's always there. So, these things go together. So, when you're doing a photograph, you could ask Sebastian Salgado, please, do a terrible picture about this terrible situation. But <laughs> I don't think it's the only way to look at it. And, uh, and I think it's no harm if you, if you do a beautiful play or a beautiful novel about a terrible situation. I mean, you don't say that about um, George Amado. You don't say that about uh, uh, a playwright or they, they deal with very difficult situations, and they do poetry, and they do art. But with photography, people somehow have this problem. And uh, so I, I showed these pictures to a curator, and she said, oh, this reminds me of this phrase of uh, Satri. And he said, beauty doesn't save what it shows. So it's kind of uh, an alert that although we are doing our best to, to do some art or to, to touch emotion of people. Still, the things are going to happen. The humankind is very strange, and we have 
very uh, good and very bad aspects and so we can do all this beautiful uh, piece of work we can do this beautiful book we can just do this show and uh, things are still going on so that's the thing um, so at this point, I'd like to open it up for just a few questions. I, I know we have a lot of food here and more drinks, and I know that people, I imagine, will be interested in that as well. But if we can take some questions or comments um, before we break up and, and, and return to the party. Unfortunately, our, our, our mobile mic does not function. So you can either come up here or you can yell. <laughs> Annie, can you... Can you project? This does work. Oh, it does work. Okay. Kind of. Kind of. Kind of. The, the Brazilian community in New Orleans, actually one of the largest groups of Brazilians in New Orleans, is actually from Algonia. And it's a <laughs> result of the, the fact that um, after after the government-sponsored uh, movement, opening a chance of Highway, um, and then when the World Bank put the new limitations on on settlements, having to look be careful about um, environmental de degradation, it meant that the sons and daughters of those people that moved to Hondonia couldn't make a living anymore, and so they started this kind of undocumented train to the United States. New Orleans became one of the places where people from Hondonia actually came, and so in Chalmette, we have one of the largest communities of people from Hondonia. Living in the United States. Wow. Yeah, that's right. wow. Uh, yeah, and I actually want to um, just mention here that Annie Gibson is probably one of the leading specialists of Brazilians in the United States and the leading specialist as an academic of Brazilians in New Orleans. Yay, she wrote a very right. fine found book um, on this topic. Um, I, I also want to, and thank you for bringing this up because I also want to give a shout out to all the Brazilians that have come out tonight. So thank you for coming. Muito obrigado aos brasileiros que vieram hoje à noite. Valeu. Do you want to do you want to respond or do you want to go keep going? Okay. Leticia had a question. So you, you want to go ahead. You can have the microphone. If anybody wants to come up here too, you can share the stage. I just I have to leave soon, so I'm sorry that I'm standing here. But I have a question kind of concerning politics right now and the situation in Brazil, the current situation, um, about the future changes that are going to happen um, with the Bolsonaro politics. I just wanted to know how you feel about that, considering that you've seen the beauty of Amazon and you've seen the destruction of Amazon. And I just wanted to understand your point of view, because I've never been there. <laughs> Well, I have to, to, to make a uh, disclosure first. I'm very bad in politics, very bad. I have very good friends that are very good in politics, so I listen to them because my, my, my vision for politics is very poor. I trust people. I believe everything will be okay. I'm an optimist, and uh, I believe in beauty, I, and I believe in the humankind. So I ve I'm very bad in politics. So <laughs> I, I'm, I'm mistaken most of the time. So what we do hope is that this new government is, is very incompetent for these questions. Uh, we hope that they don't do what they plan because they don't feel very good. But I cannot say what they, they were going to, to do. Um, but we, we hope that they are very incompetent. There is a question. Yeah. Well, yes. Yes. Have you returned back after so many years and what did you saw that made you think back about things that have changed? The people that are left and after so many years, what's left there? It, it's an interesting question. I, I went back in 2011 with a friend who is also in the documentary, Eduardo Simões, he did a huge project in the Amazon, like one of his trips I did with him. Uh, well, one main change is that uh, the gold mining, it's much more professional these days. Uh, you have more machinery, they, they are bigger, 
they are more structured. It's not so much of the lonely uh, perspective mm -hmm. anymore. So this is a huge change. Uh, other than that, it's pretty much the same. I mean, it's if you fly over the Amazon, you can in many many areas you can feel that uh, it's endless that uh, it will never be destroyed. The humankind will never be able to destroy this. It's so huge. It's so immense. The size of the rivers, the distances. You think it's, it's, it's amazing, but somehow you think it, we can't destroy it. The only problem is when you see to the satellite photos. Then you see that it's, it's coming. It's coming. It's no layer by layer. Uh, it's coming from the south, from Hondonia, and from the the, the main roads. It's it's somehow it's hurting, and it's bleeding. But still, when you when you go there, you're still amazed by the size. It's it's immense. It's immense, and I think somehow that feeling. It's part of the reason why we are destroying the Amazon because it feels so immense, it feels so long, so far away, so uh, undestroyable, is that the word? Indestructible. Undestructible. That uh, somehow you, you, you have this feeling, oh yeah, I, I do just a little bit harm here, it won't hurt, you know? So I think somehow this is in the background of Brazilians that we can use it, we can do it there. And so, but uh, the, 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 the whole thing is almost the same. You don't see more of, uh, you see much less of the uh, religious people. There is much resistance for that. Uh, you see much less of uh, non-contact uh, uh, indigenous people. And you see more of medium-sized cities, and you see uh, some more roads. But other than that, it's pretty much the same, you know, people opening small farms and so on. And if you get a chance, if you get a chance to use the tablet uh, and the program that Felipe used, there are, if you click the map icon, there are satellite photos of what that area that the photo was taken in looks like now, and you can see all the destruction and kind of the miss the gaps in the forest. Okay, two questions for you. Um, the first is, um, since your work displayed um, more of the humanity of the Galimpedos, um, did you feel it was criticized? For showing a different image than what mainstream media was showing at the time. And the second is, did you get a chance to interact with indigenous people? Good question about uh, the Canyon Pages. Well, uh, number one, I, I didn't publish this work at that time, and I didn't do a, a large exhibition. so. These pictures were seen much more now than at that time. Uh, but what I feel is that uh, two things. On one, one hand, uh, people don't, don't really look to things the way we think. Uh, people already have uh, <laughs> something in their minds. So when they look at something, they see what they want. It's it's strange. So, if people didn't like uh, uh, Garimperos, they would think the pictures are great because they they show uh, enemy of nature and full body and so on. And if people had more of a human vision, they would see that on the picture. So, and I think somehow is the way I work. <laughs> Uh, I I don't like much this idea of artists, and so I I think we hear, we give too much importance to to art and artists and everything that became so much of. And I think everybody has an art uh, feeling it at his heart, and uh, eventually everybody can be can do art in some some way. 
I don't really do a big thing about it. And uh, as a photojournalist that I, I was for many, many years, now my work is literally changing more into self-expression, but uh, I always consider myself an instrument of these people that want their pictures taken. I always feel that I am at service of nature, of history, of these people. So I think Hortensia had this experience with us last day, the other day. The, I was, we were visiting a place and, uh, and she was amazed by the fact that I, I took a picture of a man in, in, in the, near the old airport. Yeah, and the so, do you want to, to? No, you say. No, please. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because we were, she, she explained so well the way it worked. And no, I, I was amazed. Yeah. Because we went to Lakefront Airport. If you've never been there, you have to go there. It's an Art Deco jewel. And it still works, and it's half empty, and only in New Orleans. It's, it's pristine. It was re fairly recently restored, I think. And um, so anyway, we, we entered. The facade uh, is beautiful. Um, and Joao took pictures and things. And there was a chef walking in this empty kind of entry hallway. And he, they immediately connected. He was such a quintessential New Orleans figure. Very welcoming, um, a tall black man who just spoke beautifully, very articulate, very friendly, welcoming us to the place, very proud that he was the chef of this place. And he immediately connected with Joao. And they began this kind of connection and kept talking. You kept photographing him. You, he allowed him to photograph him without a question as to what he was doing with a photograph, for all he knew, this would be plastered all over the internet. He just didn't know. But you two established a, a yeah. very intimate connection. Yeah. yeah. And that, yeah. Thank you. It's like, I wanted her to, to tell it because she described so well. It's more like uh, I made him feel that he was also helping me to take his picture. That was, he was also doing the picture. So, I was trained in New York City. Uh, I was a young student there. I was taking pictures in the street, and New York is not the easiest place to photograph. <laughs> so I had to develop a way of uh, an intuition about uh, who is open to be photographed and, and how to deal with unknown people. So I've been training this all my life. And uh, I do a lot of meditation, and so I, I try to, to clean my mind and to be able to, to understand people and, and let them use my capacity as a photographer to, to help them have their own pictures taken. So actually, I don't consider my work mine. I, uh, many times I've been asked to publish the series of the Carnival Masks and so and they said, can, can we use this as a, a reminder or a small thing or as a token, etc.? I said, yes, go ahead. These pictures are not mine. Of course, if somebody wants to buy my pictures, I sell because uh, I make a living out of that, which is quite surprising because when I started, you wouldn't make a living out of selling pictures. But uh, so... Uh, all that to answer the lady, but uh, anyway, uh, that's the way I work. And I think if you are really open, if you are really open to people, truth comes. And uh, even uh, our friend Lilia Schwartz, she, in the in the video, she talks about this. It's very easy to to point a villain or to make a hero, it's very difficult to work uh, in between because uh, everybody has some of both. So this young boy burning the forest 
uh, he's a, like 11 year old boy and probably his father asked him to to burn the the, the part of the forest that they they are putting down to plant something to eat so i was interviewed in brazilian television they came to me and they asked oh please tell us who is destroying the amazon as if i could point these people as uh, and I, I, I got fed up of that, and I said, look, we are destroying the Amazon, the Brazilians, the humankind, because we keep buying the, the wood, we keep uh, eating hamburgers, so we need more cattle to raise, and we need more soybean, and we are endless. Uh, we will destroy everything if we, can, if we can. So I think that this work has this uh, characteristic of not judging people, but trying to convey their stories. I know that there was just one more question about the indigenous question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. She was asking if you did work with indigenous. Oh, yes, I, I did connect with some indigenous people, but I never lived with them. Uh, I was only telling some of the stories. Uh, we had this very strong story about the Yanomami Indian that was shot the very first time he saw a human white man. He was in a tree, and uh, the Garimpeiros came by, and yes, it's right there. And it was, uh, it's a small story that tells the whole story of the, the Yanomami Indians. It's in the, in the movie, in the documentary. I also came to the Uruelos Indian in Rondonia, and they had reacted, they had killed the, the, the gold miners. They were very proud of that. So we went there, and I stayed a few days there, and I took some pictures. I also talk about that in the... So uh, somehow I, I got some examples of uh, the situation of the Indians, but I never really belonged or stayed longer, and I don't speak, and I'm not a specialist. Um, well, I think that we could, I'm sure, go on uh, for a lot longer. We have a whole table of, of food and we have more drinks. And I want to also have an opportunity for people to come up and you know have private conversations or more individualized conversations with Joao. But I also want to just thank everybody for coming out tonight. It was a wonderful group um, of people. Uh, so thank you again and thank you, Joao. Of course, it was my honor and privilege to be here, to have my pictures at the collection. And I really want to thank you because he worked a, a whole year at this exhibition. He's a hero. <laughs> All right, thank you. And remember, the exhibit's going to be up through August, okay? So you have plenty of time. And take a look at the glass cases. There's a lot of great information there. All right. Oh,